Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to sing those words, to contemplate who we are, to contemplate what we have done, and then to think about you, your love for sinners. When we were at our worst, you sent your son. And no greater love is a man than he lays down his life for his friends. And we who were your enemies became the objects of your love. We thank you for these things. We thank you for them now. We'll thank you for them tomorrow and into eternity. We will never cease thanking you for these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Space begins at 62 miles above the earth. The space between the earth and the sun, when the sun is at its closest, is somewhere around 91 million miles. And the star nearest to us is nearly 26 trillion miles away. By the way, a billion is a thousand millions, and a trillion is a thousand billions. When you think about outer space or deep space, space beyond our own galaxy, we live and reside in a galaxy with hundreds of millions of stars, the nearest star 26 million miles away, but we're all close together in this neighborhood of stars. You go outside of the galaxy and it's lots of empty space. In fact, numbers cease to have meaning when we calculate the space. If you go the other way on the scale of size from that which is very large to that which is very small, there is also lots of space. It is said that the atom is 99.9% empty. It's mostly space. If an atom was a football stadium, the nucleus would be something like a tennis ball. And molecules which are made up of atoms rarely touch each other. And there is space between the molecules and the things that make up solid objects. <laughs> They're not so solid after all. There's lots of space between things. When you super glue two things together, you might assume that there is no space between those objects, especially if it's your fingers and something on your fingers. At the molecular level, they're not really even touching each other. You might think you've run out of space in your garage or in your hall closet. There's lots of space still in there. Did you know that there's space between this building and the building just next door to us, right behind this wall? To the casual observer, it looks like one long, continuous building from here down to Starbucks. But there's actually two and a quarter inches of space between our building and the next building. But there is no space, Christian, between God's love for you and you. There's no space between the love of God and the believer in Jesus Christ. God's personal love for you, Christian, is forever inseparable from you. God's love is closer and tighter than any bond, fixed forever by God's choice to set his unflinching affections on you, guaranteed by the death of his beloved son on the cross in your place, unlosable and unchangeable forever. This morning, we're looking at the inseparable love of God for believers at the conclusion of Romans chapter 8. Let's read together verses 35 to 39 of this monumental chapter. God writes through the Apostle Paul, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the victory lap of the love of God at the end of chapter 8. It is this resounding refrain and a crescendo of hope and confidence for those loved by God culminating this magnificent chapter on the security of believers. This all flows out of God's love for believers in Jesus Christ. Paul said in chapter 5, Hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul has affirmed in Romans chapter 8 that if God has given us his very son, how will he not graciously along with him give us all things? There is no end, no limit to the love of God for those who are his. It flows out of his very nature We're going to see this morning that Paul confirms the security of God's unassailable love for believers. He's going to unfold the security of God's unassailable love in four stages. He's building this argument in really four levels. And the first is a set of questions, seven real life questions. This begins in verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And we've grown accustomed to these rhetorical questions in Romans 8 so far. Uh, Back in verse 31, who against us? None. No one. No one could be against us. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, no one. And Who could condemn? Verse 34. Again, the unstated but implied emphatic answer to all of these rhetorical questions is no one, nobody, nothing. No one could be against us. No one could bring a charge. No one can condemn. And and now this fourth question, who or what could separate us from his love? And the word to separate here means to put distance between, to put space between, to to drive a wedge in between two entities. You know, the way that water gets into a crack in a rock and then it freezes and splits the rock in half. Could something get in between God's love and us and somehow sever the relationship, split the relationship? And while we've grown accustomed to these emphatic rhetorical questions needing no answer, and in fact going unanswered, no one could step up and condemn, no one could be against, no one could bring a charge. With this question, Paul actually offers some candidates, some potential answers. I I can think of some candidates who who might want to separate me from the love of God, or, or who at the very least might demonstrate that God doesn't love me. Real life situations that threaten the idea that God loves me. You see, the presence of affliction in my life proves that God doesn't love me. He's forgotten about me. He's unaware of what is best for me, right? And so so Paul poses seven real life questions. Questions that we feel. We can get a hold of these. We, We can understand why he has this list here. Will affliction put distance between us and God's love? Affliction. This is the most common word for hardship in the New Testament. It is outside external pressures putting the squeeze on. Will will they put a distance between God's love and me? Is there space between me and God's love evidenced by my afflictions? I mean, if God loved me, if I'm his child, couldn't he have prevented this or couldn't he have taken this affliction away? 
The second real life question, will stressful circumstances separate us from God's love? Notice Paul says, will distress. This is a, a word for, uh, to put someone into narrow straits. It's the same word Jesus used in talking about a narrow path that leads to salvation. Uh, Will these narrow confines, these stressful circumstances, separate me from God's love? Could persecution put space between us and the love of God? Either because some persecutor of the faith might do something that harms me and puts me out of God's love, or I might defect under pressure. Could hunger separate us from God's love? Absolute destitution and poverty that made me longing for my next meal and not knowing where it's coming from. What about nakedness? A lack of the kind of clothing that would protect me from the elements and not having resources to provide for myself. Could that remove me from God's love or perhaps be an evidence that God doesn't love me? What about danger, peril, unforeseen circumstances that pose threat to life and to limb, or the sword? This is not the broad, long sword of the soldier in combat. This is the short, dagger sword of the hit-and-run assassin, a reference either to persecution leading to martyrdom or perhaps even the sword of authorities and governmental powers that might take someone's life for following Christ. These were real life questions for Paul. He didn't leave this rhetorical question unanswered. He throws some candidates out there that might be a threat to our feeling the love of God, to our trusting in the love of God, or, or maybe even to our being connected to the love of God. And none of these things were foreign to Paul's own experiences. I just want to read some of the things that Paul describes from his own life, and you'll hear that these things aren't hypothetical for him. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you're prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You're distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated. We're homeless. We toil, working with our own hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us and life in you. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I've been on frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. 2 Corinthians 12.10, he says, I am well content with weakness, insults, distresses, persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew what it was like to endure these things. The list of seven real life situations circumstances that perhaps might threaten a believer's experience of the love of God have only affirmed for the Apostle Paul the security of the love of God in his life. He has come through each one of those only with this strong crescendo statement at the end of Romans chapter 8 that the love of God is rock solid and cannot be moved 
and cannot be removed from those upon whom he has set his affections. So at the end of his life, Paul tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of my chains. Listen, Paul's imprisonment was not a a signal to the whole world that God had forsaken him, that God had ceased loving him. Paul affirmed to the very end that he was loved by God. And that would never flinch. The first stage in Paul's argument about the love of God being secure for believers is these seven real life questions. And again, the implied, emphatic response is nothing. No, of course, none of these could separate us from the love of God. A second stage in Paul's argument is something of a counterintuitive encouragement. Listen to the verses together. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Of course, none of these things can or ever will. Just as it is written, here's the proof. For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's strange. That is a strange argument to make, Paul. You've said that these things can't separate me from the love of God, and, and, and then you appeal to the Old Testament and a lament psalm to demonstrate that we're being put to death all today and led as sheep to the slaughter? What kind of an encouragement is this? <laughs> this is a very counterintuitive encouragement. No suffering will ever separate you from God's love. Just as, as it is written, you'll be dying all day. And you'll be slaughtered like sheep. You see, the preservation of God's people and the guarantee of his love is not a promise of avoidance of trouble. In fact, if you are suffering as a Christian, you have not proven that God has forgotten to love you, nor that you have caused him to withdraw his love from you somehow. In fact, if you're suffering, you are indeed in good company. You're in good company. And so the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 44. He quotes one verse out of Psalm 44 that has two parts, death all day and sheep for slaughter. Not particularly encouraging. Let's look together at Psalm 44. We need to see what it is that Paul is appealing to. Psalm 44 is one of the songs of the sons of Korah. It is a lament psalm. It follows the patterns of lament psalms. It is a crying out to God for help. Listen to the words. O God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations. Then you planted them. You afflicted the peoples. Then you spread them abroad. For by their own sword they did not possess the land, and their own arm did not save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your presence, for you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we will push back our adversaries. Through your name we will trample down those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor will my sword save me, but you have saved us from our adversaries, and you have put to shame those who hate us. In God, we have boasted all day long, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Yet, you have rejected us and brought us to dishonor. And do not go out with our armies. You cause us to turn back from the adversary, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You give us as sheep to be eaten and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people cheaply and have not profited by their sale. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and derision to those around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my dishonor is before me and my humiliation has overwhelmed me. Because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles. Because of the presence of the enemy and the avenger. 
all this has come upon us. But we have not forgotten you, and we have not dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, and our steps have not deviated from your way, yet you have crushed us in a place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or extended our hands to a strange God, would not God find this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. But for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Arouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awake, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul has sunk down into the dust. Our body cleaves to the earth. Rise up. Be our help. And redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness. This lament psalm from the sons of Korah reflects rich theology based on biblical history. They knew about those whom God had rescued by his own arm, and they knew not to trust in their own weapons. They hated idolatry. They stayed loyal to Yahweh, and yet suffering came. Discouragement came. Perplexity. Despair. This is real experience. By the way, in here is no confession of sin. This is not like many of the psalms where the psalmist realizes, oh, I was behaving this way and I needed to correct this and and now I've turned towards Yahweh and things are going to go better. In fact, what we see here is suffering unrelated to their conduct. They're sinners. The sons of Korah are sinners like every other human being, but, but they're not sinners in the matter causing their suffering. Their suffering's unrelated to their sins. Like Job, the psalmist here, and those associated with him are afflicted. And there's no explanation as to why. No connection to a lack of faith, to idolatry, to moral compromise. And verse 22 of Psalm 44 is the verse that Paul quotes for us in Romans 8. For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And based on what I read from the Apostle Paul earlier, you can understand why he picked up this psalm. Hounded all day. He carried about in his own body death all the time. It meant life for those who would hear the gospel, but for him personally, it was death after death after death and ultimately culminated in his physical death. This suffering described here is the genuine article. Listen, the power of positive thinking cannot whisk this away. But Psalm 44 concludes with a plea of faith. Notice the psalmist did not say, that's it, God. I've suffered. I've had it. I'm out of here. I'm no longer loyal to you. No, the psalmist clings and the apostle Paul clings with a white knuckle grip in the face of suffering to the very thing that Paul says cannot be separated from God's people, the love of God. Psalm 44, 26 is the conclusion. And I think this is why Paul selected this psalm. Did you notice that last verse? The psalmist says, Rise up, be our help, and redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness. In other words, he bases his faith-filled plea on the inseparable love of God for his people. He knows where to turn. I think this is why the Apostle Paul selected this psalm. The lament song leads us to look up in expectant faith, trusting in the love of God for his people. And that's precisely where Paul goes in Romans 8.37. This is real anguish. People perplexed and vexed by hardship. (laughs) And this prayer, this plea, rise up, be our help, and redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness, expresses the real emotion in the experience leading up to this plea. The the, the prayer is founded on the love of God for his people. The psalm portrays faith in the midst of a perplexing trial. Only God is the hope for the psalmist. He doesn't turn anywhere else. There is nowhere else to turn. 
there is no other basis for a plea than the love of God. He certainly couldn't complain. (laughs) What right has a sinner to complain before his maker? But to appeal to the love of God for his people. And listen, Christian, if you're suffering, look up and look around. You're in good company. Calvin said, it is no new thing for the Lord to permit his saints to be undeservedly exposed to the cruelty of the ungodly. This is kind of normal. And consider this phrase, the sheep of slaughter. This is a familiar phrase in our Bibles. We, we know what sheep for slaughter were all about. Leviticus 14, 13, the male lamb was to be slaughtered in the place where they slaughter the sin offering and the burnt offering. In Ezra 6.20, we read that the Levites purified themselves and they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all of the exiles, both for their brothers and for themselves. And then Jeremiah the prophet takes up the image of a slaughtered lamb in Jeremiah 11.19. I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know that they had devised plots against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. Isaiah takes this similar metaphor and applies it to Yahweh's servant, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. I did some reading this week on on, uh, someone who visited a slaughterhouse for pigs. Lots of noise and then a slaughterhouse for sheep. Silence. The metaphor is interesting. For a Savior who came to lay down his life on purpose in the place of sinners, he was like a sheep, silent before the slaughter. And of course, this imagery culminates in the book of Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. In Revelation 5, 12, the concentric circles of worship surrounding this lamb, singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And those associated with the lamb slain are said in the book of Revelation to be slain. Revelation 6, 9 talks about tribulation era martyrs. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And then Revelation 13, 8 tells us that all who dwell on the earth worship him, that is, they worship the Antichrist uh, during that time. Those whose name have not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who had been slain. You see, the, the, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain. Those who associate with him are treated in similar fashion. This glorious culmination of the worship of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation means that heaven has never graduated from the idea that the Lamb was slain for sinners. For all of eternity, the one with the scars in his hands and his feet and in his side forever bears the marks of his substitutionary death in the place of sinners for love. And if you find yourself under affliction even to the point of a sheep under slaughter or being killed all day long. You're in good company and you are loved. You are loved by the lamb slain. There's a danger in our day of a fraudulent gospel. The kind of message that is heard in much of popularized Christianity, a message that presents Christianity with no suffering. Have you heard this? Have you seen this? The prosperity gospel that the United States has exported to Latin America and to Africa and has become sort of the the dominant view 
of Christ in Protestantism. It connects the love of God and a relationship to God and the blessings of God. It ties them all to earthly comfort, physical health, and financial prosperity. Since God loves you, you should expect pleasant circumstances in your life, a better job, a happier family, nicer things, a healthier body, positive relationships. Well, what happens when the economy crashes? When you lose your job, when you get sick, when your loved ones die, when your friends betray you, when thieves break in and steal your stuff, when moth and rust destroy, what happens when Christianity is illegal, when owning a Bible is a capital offense? Now, that so-called gospel you believed turns to dust. It really is no gospel at all. It, It really is rather a genie in a bottle idolatry. If I rub this lamp and say the right words, out comes the genie and gives me what I want. The true gospel transcends earthly circumstance. It doesn't rearrange your earthly circumstance to make them what you always wanted. For us, that would be such a tragedy that, that we would end up worshiping and serving the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised. God has appointed our earthly life and our eternal life to go differently than that. We suffer here now with Christ. We associate with Him. The love of God is not measured by your bank account or your physical condition. Believer, the love of God is measured for you at the cross of Christ. Do you know that? The reality of the Christian life is, as Jesus said in Luke 21, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. What? They'll put some of you to death, but not a hair of your head will perish. I thought if I got put to death, all the hairs of my head, whatever was left of them, would perish. But this sounds a lot like Romans 8, doesn't it? Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Just as it's written, sheep for slaughter, dying all day. (laughs) Jesus said it. You'll be hated because of my name. You'll be put to death and yet not a hair of your head will perish. What does that mean? There is a life which transcends your earthly existence and a love of God that will never leave you. I read this week William Tyndale's 1534 translation of this verse. He said it this way, for for the first time from Greek into English, for thy sake we are killed all day long and are counted as sheep appointed to be slain. And at this point in Tyndale's life, he was in Antwerp, outside of his country, away from his home, uh, on the run. His life was threatened And he was betrayed and killed in October 1536. His crime, translation of the Bible into English. Our Bible today. Strangled and then burned at the stake. He said as he was dying, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. That is a man whose life transcended his mortal earthly existence. That is a man loved by God, for whom the love of God was never removed. As this lament song leads us to look up from our suffering to the love of God for his people, so the Apostle Paul turns our attention to the love of God in verse 37. And that gives us the third stage of the development of his, Paul, of his case, that the love of God is secure for the believer, inseparable from us. And this third stage of Paul's argument is one excessive victory. One excessive victory. Notice verse 37, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. It's two English words, overwhelmingly conquer. One Greek word that Paul probably made up. This is the first time this word is seen in any literature. And we get our uh, brand name Nike from the main verb here, nikao. It, It means to conquer, to win, to have victory. And then the first part of the word is just hyper. 
This is a hyper victory. Uh, this is a super conquer. And, and notice what Paul says about this. We, we hyper conquer in all these things. Again, this is not a promise to avoid these things. You don't conquer these things by getting out of them, getting around them. But a promise to overwhelmingly conquer in them. And notice, this is not by our own strength. This is not something you muster up. This is not mere human fortitude. This is divine agency. This is from God. We conquer through him. And notice who loved us. The one who loved us. He is the agent of our hyper-conquering. And loved here is past tense. The love highlighted here is God's love for us, seen at the cross. There God gave his son. And when God gave his son at the cross, he gave us everything. And that love, past tense, a reality for believers, ushers us into the saving, personal, eternal, never-leaving, unflinching love for God in us, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This is not the general love of God for humanity. This is the special, unique, saving, eternal, personal love of God for believers in Jesus Christ. No greater love is a man than he lay down his life for his friends. It's a remarkable thing when, when a human lays down his life for another human. Storming the beaches at Normandy. A soldier jumping on a grenade for his buddy. Someone putting themselves in the line of fire for for another person. But God loved us when we were his enemies. And we're not equals. Infinite distance separates the values of these persons. We are infinite non-equals. And so the cross introduces us to this selfless, unbelievable, personal, unrelenting love that will never fade, can never be interrupted, will never be vanquished, can never get bored, will never be revoked, rescinded, withdrawn, or transferred. God has already done the infinitely impossible hard thing by loving us when we are at our worst and putting his son in our place to crush him for our sins, to continue his love for us. It's no big thing for him. He will never be moved away from it. And this love of God towards us guarantees excessive victory in affliction. More victory than is required. A hyper-conquering, an uber-win, a super-triumph. We might still be thinking, how? I mean, where's the win in affliction? Peril. Danger, nakedness, sword, famine. I want to help us think through some of the things we've already covered in Romans 8. When our enemies, Romans 8, 28, are made to serve eternal and glorious good purposes. Listen, affliction meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Even our enemies have to bow the knee and yield to what God is doing in the life of a believer for his own good and for God's glory. There's a win in this that afflictions produce for us, in Paul's language from 2 Corinthians 4, 17, an eternal weight of glory. It far outweighs them all. You you put glory on the scale with affliction, and, and they shouldn't even be stated in the same sentence. They're so disproportionate. What afflictions produce for us can't even be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us, Romans 8, 18. And there's a win in our increasing refinement of our experience of Christ's love. Listen, you know this. You go through a trial, you cry out like the lament psalm, Psalm 44. You you don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. And you know that God is the only place I have to turn, so I turn to him and I bank on his love. And you experience his love all over again. And that refines us. That refines our experience of God's love and bolsters our faith. And God never fails in this. And another win in this for us is that none of these things can take away what really matters. None of these things can take away what really matters. Listen, all of the the threatenings of affliction and poverty and persecution, they say, I'm going to take everything from you. 
I have Christ. You, you got nothing. You can't take anything away from me that lasts. You can't take anything away from me that really matters. This is why Jim Elliott, in seeking to take the gospel to the Alka Indians, speared through on the banks of the Kurere River. Long before that time, he had welded this thought to his heart. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He understood that no affliction, no persecution, no sword, no spear could take what really matters. He wins. And the win for us really is that we outlast them all. We outlive them all. We overcome, as John says, the world. A believer by definition, 1 John 5, is one who overcomes the world. Same verb there. What does a super conqueror look like? I think a super conqueror looks like Stephen. Acts 7. Preached a sermon that every Jew should have just agreed with. It was just Old Testament narrative. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. I'm just quoting your Bible, guys. Helping you understand how Jesus, the Messiah, raised from the dead is the one all of this was pointing to. And they pick up rocks. And they throw rocks at him until he's unconscious and dead. Acts 7, 59, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. That is an uber conqueror. He wins in his own martyrdom. There was a guy there named Saul, an ally with those killing Stephen. The Lord won with Paul. At the end of Paul's life, he says, 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18, at my first offense, no one supported me, all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Sounds like Stephen, doesn't it? But the Lord stood with me. He strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How did Paul get safely home? Probably by Nero removing his head. That doesn't sound safe to me. Paul thought it was safe. Hugh Latimer was a super conqueror and his buddy, Nicholas Ridley. They were both to be burned at the stake as heretics outside Balliol College in Oxford, 16 October, 1555. Their crime, preaching the Bible, preaching the gospel, and they wouldn't give it up. Hugh Latimer said to Nicholas Ridley as they were tied together to the stake, about to be set on fire. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. And we're all beneficiaries in the English-speaking world of their uber victories. The last part of Paul's argument about the security of God's love for believers is found in verses 38 and 39. It is his 10 confident assertions. Listen to what Paul says. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here Paul gives a reason for the uber victory, the overwhelmingly conquering it is the inability of anything, including temporal hardship, to put space between us and the love of God. The love of God for us, inseparably, is the reason for the victory over all these things, the victory in all of these things. Paul says, for I am convinced, Paul was persuaded Paul was persuaded inside and out. In fact, he had experienced these things. Just about everything on this list, his own death he would experience soon. 
Notice what Paul puts first in the list. Sometimes we think, oh, life and death. Paul reverses it. Paul says, I am convinced that death will not be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We've come to understand that death is, by definition, separation. Death is a separation. The spiritual death at the Garden of Eden meant that Adam and Eve were separated from immediate fellowship with a glorious, holy God. Humanity has been living in that separation ever since. We understand that physical death is the separation of the immaterial from the material you. It's the disintegration of the human constitution. Separated from your physicality. We understand that death is a separation from loved ones and life here under the sun. We understand that eternal death is a separation from everything that is good and pleasant and beautiful and desirable and enjoyable for people about the infinite radiating glory of God. Those who are in the lake of fire will be in the presence of God. He is omnipresent. They will be in the presence of his wrath and anger and the fury of his goodness expressed in righteous anger against their sins. But Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that they'll be separated from him. That is the the beauty and the glory of his enjoyable presence. Death is a separation. Now I want you to think about your last moments here. What it will be like to close your eyes for the last time. What it will be like to breathe your last breath here under the sun. Listen, you you will be separated from friends here. You will be separated from family here. You will be separated from pleasant meals here and sweet relationships and, and delightful enjoyments. But you will never, ever, not for a fleeting moment, not for a split second, be separated from the love of God nor the experience of the love of God. That is an unbreakable bond that death itself cannot touch. Not death. And not life either. Listen, I I think this is probably more challenging for believers. More threatening for believers. Listen, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord better by far. There, I can't sin. (laughs) I can't be persecuted. I can't face pressures to renege on my commitment to Christ. I can't be distracted by worldly things. I, I can't displease my Savior there. Life is hard. We're beset by trials and temptations and distractions and earthly things. Some of them good, some of them horrible. And all of them have the possibility to threaten my spiritual life. But listen, for the genuine believer, life cannot separate you from the love of God either nor angels, and this one's hypothetical. Listen, no no angel. Here he means good angels. It's in contrast to bad angels in the next phrase. No angel is going to separate you from the love of God. The point of this verse is no angel could, right? And it's hypothetical like Galatians 1. Even if an angel from heaven were to preach to you a false gospel, no angel's gonna do that. And no angel's gonna separate you from the love of God. And, And no demons either. Paul calls them here principalities. Uh, Most often in Paul's language, this refers to the the evil powers of of the spirit world, demons, Satan's henchmen, and Satan himself. And oh, would they love to separate you from the love of God. It's kind of their calling card and job description. And they fail every time at separating genuine believers from the love of God. They, They cannot, they do not have the ability Things present cannot separate you from the love of God. There's nothing you're facing in your life right now that has the potential to separate you from the love of God, believer. Nor things to come. We think a lot about things to come. We think about tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And You need to understand <laughs> there's nothing coming. There's nothing that could come. There's nothing that will ever come that could ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And if you have the love of God, you have everything. Powers 
can't separate you from the love of God. Uh, Paul might here mean supernatural powers. Uh, Powers is often used with signs and wonders to describe uh, spiritual things, evil and and good, and and maybe spiritual entities. Uh, Simon the magician was called the great power of God. Uh, Paul might have in mind here natural powers, governmental authorities. In other words, there's nothing that has any kind of authority, spiritual or otherwise, that could ever separate you from the love of God. And not height nor depth. Listen, above 26,000 feet on Mount Everest, it's called the death zone. You can't survive up there very long. The death zone can separate you from oxygen, but you know it could never separate you from the love of God. And the Marianas Trench at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, 7.2 miles deep, with a PSI of uh, somewhere around uh, 16,000 pounds per square inch of pressure at the bottom of that uh, uh, trench, could separate you from light and warmth and could crush you, but it could never separate you from the love of God. And Paul closes out the list with any other created thing. If there's anything that didn't make the list, if there's anything I left out, by the way, what's created? Everything but God. He's uncreated, everything else is created. This pretty much rounds out the list. And because God has set his affections and his love on you, Christian, you must be persuaded as Paul is persuaded that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's some thoughts for consideration. If you are doubting your security in Christ... I want to borrow some advice uh, from a commentator who says, take the approach of the sinner in need. You're wondering about, uh, do, do I have an interest in Christ? Is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Am I loved by God? Am I secure? Take the approach of the sinner in need. The commentator says, if you are troubled with doubts, go and sit down on the sinner's seat and say, God declares righteous the ungodly who trust him. I renounce all thoughts of my own righteousness, and as a sinner, I trust the God who raised Christ from the dead. He was delivered up for my trespasses. Go there and trust him. Anchor yourself in the love of God for sinners at the cross and there will never be any other doubt of any lack of love for God. It was demonstrated most and most fully at the cross of Christ. If he's done that while you were his enemy for you, he will never let you go. He will never unlove you. You will always be secure in him. If you're here this morning and and you've never come to grips with your own sin... I just want to warn you about listening to a passage like this and thinking, oh, I'm good. God loves me. You need to understand that God does not love you this way if you don't belong to him. This is God's special love for his people. And listen, it's available and belongs to everyone who repents and believes the gospel. This is a a universal love in the sense that it goes out to every single one who recognizes his sin and turns to Christ as the only solution and turns from his old life, embraces God through Jesus Christ. God's love belongs to you, friend, if you will turn to him. But if you will sit content in that old life and stay there in your sins, I'd love to be forgiven. I'd love to have heaven. I'd love to have someone love me. That'd be great. But I I really love this, that, or the other thing that displeases him. Well, you can't have God's love. But if you give up on trash and embrace Christ, you will have everything and you will always be loved by the God of the universe. And my invitation to you would be, if you have never yet known the love of God personally, come to him today. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who 
loved me and gave himself up for me. And again, he assured Timothy at the end of his life, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you understand the love of God is the security of your eternity, believer? Let's pray. Oh God, what a marvelous, inexhaustible fountain is this, your love. We could never plumb its depths. We could never see its breath. In fact, the Apostle Paul, whom we've been reading, prayed for the Ephesian believers that they would know the love of God for them, which was surpassing all knowledge. We feel that way here this morning. God, we... We know your love, we want to know your love, and yet it exceeds our ability to grasp. The deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, free, our only hope and our security. We praise you for it and we sing now for your glory in Jesus' name.